that was uh, scintillating trends. Very profound. I was uh, I was telling uh, Hamid Harun yesterday that I wish people like him, you know, speak to our uh, prime minister and uh, the advisors to the prime minister, so that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. We, we have about half an hour for uh, a question-answer session. My colleague uh, Dhawal will conduct the session. Please identify yourselves. Keep your questions brief. And let's continue this conversation. Yeah. I'm a Sindhi Amal that you mentioned about just now. I've stayed in Karachi till 1962. I passed out of St. Patrick's uh, High School. Um, why I'm speaking to you is I have some kind of a, a link with Don. When I was in Karachi staying on Clayton Road, my neighbor used to be the estranged wife of Z.A. Soleri, whose daughter Nuzat used to go to school with me. Uh, I, I don't know where Nuzat is or whether uh, Soleri either preceded Altaf Hussain or succeeded Altaf Hussain. I'm a little vague on that. Soleri was editor of Pakistan Time, not Dawn. Oh, not Dawn, okay. Oh, that worked with Dawn for a short period. Try, okay. Time. Yeah. And uh, when, you talked, uh, when you talked of uh, Bhambor just now, it reminded me of Shah Abdul Latif's uh, Sindhi song, Rahi Vanyu Raat Bhambor Me. I was telling Geeta Simoyes uh -huh. day before yesterday, the Mehtanis and my family have been very close. They were the leading Hindu family of Karachi. Yeah. Rock House. Uh, Rock, Rock House, House yeah. at the forefront of culture. Mm -hmm. And Sushila Mehtani, one of Sin's most famous daughters yeah. who now lives in the Canary Islands, lent her voice to the famous Shah Abdul Latif Kafi, Pere Pavandi San Chavandi San Rahi Vanjarat Bhambor Me. She's never been able to come back to Pakistan, but she left behind a golden legacy. My father had that film produced at the Eastern Film Studios in Karachi. So I'm very proud of that association. And then just one other thing on this. Uh, uh, I'm also in the management committee of uh, Khudabadi Amal Association. And we are, uh, uh, we are doing a book on tracing the history of Amals, how they have come from, uh, from Pakistan, and how they are spread out and what they are doing. So I, uh, when we get a little further on this, uh, I will get in touch with Mr. Kulkarni. My niece, Nandita Bhavan, Bhavnani, does a lot of work on Sindh also. So I just thought. I, thought I would mention to you, since you have spoken of what area you're working on, that the Lohana Amils and the family of Sir Naumal Naum Hotchand were the people who founded Karachi uh, they moved from a settlement which they had created on the, on the left bank of the Hub River up to the present situation of Karachi as Karadhar and Mithadar in the 18th century. The Hindus play a major role in the formation of Karachi. It is annexed by Kalat subsequently and taken over from the Talpurs by the British. But the Hindu contribution to Karachi continues till 1943. They are the, not the majority, but at 42%, the single largest community in Karachi. Karachi's miracle under the Raj was created not only from Bombay, but by Sindhis, many of whom, the majority of whom perhaps also might have been Hindus in Karachi. My name, uh, Hamid, I... Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, 
No, what uh, you mentioned the Maharashtra archives, if I could add another uh, bit to this sort of cross-cultural, uh, not cross-cultural, but cross-boundary uh, dissemination of knowledge. Uh, a few years ago, I edited for the Archaeological Survey of India's 150th year, the album of photographs, of 150 photographs of a shared Archaeological Survey of India's history. And interestingly, when you walk into the archives of the ASI in Delhi, there are volumes. When you want to look for Bombay or you want to look for Karachi, you go to Bombay volumes. And under the many Bombay albums, I found amazing photographs of the discovery of Mohinjodaro, of uh, Mortimer Wheeler there, Rakhaldas Banerjee standing uh, in the, the, uh, the ruins of uh, the Indicites in Pakistan. And if I may suggest, if we could both on both ends work with our governments. There should just those photographs of ASI, early ASI photographs to do with sites in Pakistan and early discoveries could be an exhibition that could be hosted in Karachi. And I'd be happy to curate it because I just went through piles and piles and piles of, of albums and images to look for those photographs. Again, with Bombay and Karachi, we have we have shared histories. We have Bartle Frere, who was, in a sense, the modern you know, uh, builder of both these cities. If a group of architectural students from Mumbai could go to Karachi to map the architectural contributions of Bartle Frere in Karachi, and similarly, you have an amazing school, the Indus School in, Kara uh, in uh, Karachi. If students of architecture from Karachi could come here to map the, uh, the buildings of uh, the Bartle Frere period. Uh, not only that, perhaps not now, but maybe a decade later, maybe 15 years later, why doesn't India and Pakistan do a joint trans-border nomination for Indus Valley sites for world heritage status? We have the finest between India and Pakistan. Why, why can't we have Lothal, Mohinjadaro, Harappa, Kalibangan, Dholavira as one serial nomination? That's a trans-border nomination for the Indus Valley culture. I think I need to address several points that you raised. They're all very relevant. I'll come to them one by one. The first one, I think, is with respect to uh, why only Maharashtra archives. Beginning with Mar Maharashtra archives, we are hoping for our collaborators, the Observer Research Foundation, to demarcate other archives located across the breadth of the Bombay presidency, which are of any importance to this. I think that that will partly satisfy what you say. I would like to point out that the use of images and the importance of images is very high in our research. And we need to collate, define, and to use those images in our research. And they'll very much be the part of intended publication. There's one thing I don't share. Whereas I'm happy to let gov governments uh, take control when the time comes, but the initiative to search must be on a bilateral basis with the Observer Research Foundation. I have waited too long for governments to be able to agree to these kinds of things. I remember after the Agra talks when the current foreign minister, Sushma Swaraj, told me it would not be possible for me to go to the Pune Film Institute and see a film of Madame Noor Jahan made in Bombay in 1943. And poor Mahesh Bhatt had to travel all that way, view the film, and bring me back some of the accounts of its music because they were not available in the recorded form except in the film. So I think we have to be careful that governments are not given authority to make or close those projects. I think we have to go forward and take the government blessing and take the government help where, uh, help where it's necessary. It's what I think Mahatma Gandhi said, self-help and self-dependence is more important than a dependence where the intentions are unknown I want this project to wind up in the next five years so we can take the results of it forward, publish them. Maybe there'll be 20 volumes of documents from the Maharashtra archives and other archives in this area. But that'll begin the process of making us learn about each other. Let the people also from Surat, from, from Mumbai, from other parts of this region, let them learn in Karachi and Hyderabad and other cities what their heritage is. So it's not only giving us our heritage, or giving your people their heritage. It's giving all of us from this region our own heritage in Karachi. And I think that's important. I think helping each other recognize the contour forms of our intellectual legacy 
will be one step forward. I'm completely in agreement with you, except for the point about governments being in charge. My experience with governments has not been great, but with historians, archaeologists, uh, I think researchers, we can put the future of our legacy of the western coastline of the, uh, of, of the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean Rim in better hands. Hello. Uh, sir, my name is Dr. Rajesh Sarvadnya. I'm a founder of Vivekanand Youth Connect. And I would like to know the influence of social media on the Pakistani youth and what kind of role social media can play in bringing the youths of India and Pakistan together. I'm afraid I'm going to make an unpopular answer. It's not that I dislike social media. It's that I stay away from the net at every time because there are even false, multiple false sites operating in my name. I even hear there are sites which tell people, exhort people to pray five times a day as good Muslims. I don't, they are not my sites. I never read them. I don't go to them, but they seem to operate and have a life of their own. The problem with social media is that social media, as you all know, from both India and Pakistan, are subject to very major penetration by governments and thinking groups. I have never come across a social media site uh, where uh, an Indian doesn't drop in to uh, abuse my brother Mahesh Bhatt. So it's not that I think that they should not be done. I simply believe that large organizations and governments have a method of dominating social media, particularly in Pakistan, and therefore we should beware. I have just two days ago sent a major complaint to the president, the prime minister, the chief justice of Pakistan about the journalists in the Dawn Media Group being under physical threat in social media. If you write against the smallest public personality who is in government, then they want to investigate and arrest the people concerned for using hate speech. But when it comes to killing journalists, their consciences seem to run dry. So I think that social media is wonderful. Having young people express themselves is the most wonderful part of it. But having them converted into forums of hate speech as the right wing and the Taliban have been doing and as the IS has been doing, even on Pakistani territory and on Pakistani servers, I think we need to approach that freedom not with trepidation, but with caution. Yeah, my name is Feroz. Uh, two questions, one historical, because your entire sweep of history was astounding. So one is going back, and I think a little uh, expansion on the rising star of Mehergarh that you spoke about, because that was something new for most, I believe. So what is that common legacy which arises from Mehergarh, which we need to know about, I think should be explained a bit more. And the other point is in the contemporary context, where you spoke about the threat from the Northwest frontier, which we have faced time and again in the past. So how is Pakistani society dealing with the, uh, the crisis within Islam, as I would put it? Because IS is uh, the symbol of the crisis within Islam and the implosion, I believe, within Islam, uh, which it is facing today. So how as Indian and Pakistani citizens and as governments should we deal with this entire threat which is coming from the Middle East back through West Asia into our borders? Thank you. I think that with respect to the first question which was about <laughs> Mehergarh, I think that Mehergarh's remains have been looked at in a way that we find out for the first time how South Asian man was thinking, how he was eating, what foodstuffs he digested, how his farm economy was, uh, was made up, how his urban metropolis was created, how uh, I think people lived in South Asia. And I think living that sense of separation was subject to scrutiny when the archaeologists first went to Gedrosia or Makran and they explored the pottery shards, they found thousands of different kinds of pottery shards. What they hadn't accounted for was the presence of the flash floods in the Indus. So they believed that the thousands of pottery shards in the same period at the same level reflected diverse cellular village economies and the lack of civilization meant that there was no major culture in South Asia at some of the most important periods like the Neolithic 
and these were all different village communities, which turned out to be village communities 2,000 years later, and it shows that, like the Marxian model says, South Asia was a static model of development. Of course, subsequently, they were all proved wrong, because they thought the pottery shard remains were over a three to 500-year period, and they were about uh, 1500 to 700 BC. They then discovered upon closer examination and structural analyses of flash floods and river bends that these covered over three and a half thousand years of history. And they showed standardized cultures which had developed their pottery by certain techniques and certain motifs. And that, yes, the western flank of, of uh, South Asia, as a representative of the civilization of the Vedas that further moved to the Gangetic Plain, was not cellular village insular type economies. We were not governed by the village idiot. We were governed by a very stable material culture which speaks much about our level of social organization. Unfortunately, many prehistoric sites don't have a tongue to speak. But if Mehrgar could speak, it would tell you how we were more civic seven and a half, nine, eight, nine and a half thousand years ago than some parts of India and Pakistan are today. This, the second question was with respect to? Yeah, I, I, I think that the major problem up there is I, I don't agree with your description of this representing a schism in Islam. Islam does not give people the right to kill. Even the, uh, e e even the Shif Senaiks only throw ink on Mr. Kulkarni. There are some civilized norms of behavior. I'm not supporting the throwing of ink on Mr. Kulkarni. I'm trying to point out that no religion, no religion of God allows people to unlawfully kill other people. And therefore, this is not a schism within Islam. This is a form of humanity or lack of it, which I find appalling, I find disgraceful, and I find that it is inimical to South Asia, it's inimical to Pakistan. Why should I not want that protection for India? Why would I want India's cities to be flooded with these people? I think we need to fight back. We need to speak to each other. And you know, it's not that the Indian government is a particularly evil kind of government, but you need the sense to understand that one of the reasons why these factions have been promoting battles between India and Pakistan is they want India to move against Pakistan with saber rattling, particularly when the Fatah areas and high outposts of these terrorists are under attack. I was able to speak to Mr. Advani at that time. Mr. Advani is not in government when he was leader of the opposition. And believe me, it was a long discussion and there were many people from Pakistan there. He understood with clarity that India should not fall under a trap and allow uh, a distrust between Indian and Pakistani decision makers where it comes to terrorist induced moves in Kashmir or any other part, but should meet the situation with full understanding. In fact, the, the statement from the Indian Foreign Ministry spokesman in Islamabad a few weeks after that clarified the matter. So even people like Mr. Advani, who are not always respected for their stances, I have the greatest respect for Mr. Advani because I saw him at uh, at the Raj exhibition, as Sudhinder points out, and subsequently. I'm not sanitizing his domestic policy. I can only say with respect to Pakistan, he showed more understanding and more courage than many others who have, have exhibited since then. It's not an Indian problem. It's not that India is bad and Pakistan is good. I think the conduct of Pakistani politicians, too, is deplorable. But nobody is so bad as to be lumped together with the IS and with the Taliban and these anti-human people who believe in taking human life, neither Hinduism, nor Sikhism, nor Islam, nor Christianity, sanctions this unlawful taking of life and the killing of human beings, which is a dishonor to the sacred foundations of these religions. So I think, let us speak of them as the common enemy, not as part of us. And let us move in every way possible to try and curb them. I'm Mohammed Wajuddin from the Times of India. You talked about the Berlin Wall, but there have been attempts to break this Berlin Wall, and one attempt was when Mr. Bajpay took the bus to Lahore. To celebrate that historic moment, the poet Ali Sadar Jafri said in a couplet, 
کہ تم آؤ گلشن لاہور سے چمن بردوش ہمائے صبح بنارس کی روشنی لے کر ہمالیہ کی ہواؤں کی تازگی لے کر پھر اس کے بعد یہ دیکھے کہ کون دشمن ہے اٹ واز لاہور بٹ واز میٹ آفر یو کم فرام کراچی بٹ دا پوائنٹ ہیئر دا کوشچن دیٹ آئی وانٹ ٹو آسک سنس آئی کم فرام دا میڈیا ورلڈ اینڈ یو آلسو بلانگ ٹو یو آر میڈیا بیرن یو نو وائی دیر از پاسٹی آف دا انیبلیٹی آف دا نیوز پیپرس یو نو وین وی وی آر آئی واز پارٹ آف دا ٹیم آف جرنلسٹ وین ٹو کراچی اینڈ لاہور اے کپل آف ایئرس اے گو ود ان فائن ٹائمس آف انڈیا اور انڈین ایکسپریس اوور دی آن دا اسٹیٹس سملرلی یو کانٹ فائن دا ڈاؤن ہیئر the 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 question is one journalist is stationed at you know uh, uh, in islamabad cannot go to rawalpindi which is just a few kilometers away similarly a journalist in new delhi cannot go to gurgaon the point here is the bureaucratic you know setup they have they have confined the, the whole thing so has there been you know any attempt from your side or the media people over there to kind of open up because you, we cannot bring the people together we, we keep talking about people to people contact but the point here is we don't know the f- opinions N- not everybody go to internet and see what don is saying about certain things similarly not everybody goes to times of india in pakistan so how can we open up and how can we make the two governments understand that you have to make the media free you have to make the travel of a journalist you know more convenient so that there is exchange of ideas thank you my experience with this matter is what you're saying is absolutely accurate you have to understand that all i've been able to discover over the years both the indian and pakistani governments both of which i do not agree with have seen it fit to regulate the flow of newspapers they even allow television sometimes but the flow of newspapers across these boundaries is not something they're interested in because they don't like sober voices questioning their behavior i think that that flow of newspapers was inimical to rajiv gandhi's government to subsequent sang- uh, congress governments to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, the bjp and other governments and let me tell you that to all pakistani governments in the same period so really and truly where the weakness lies is unless you and i and people from our profession get together and there have been times that we have done it and done it successfully and push for this this is not going to happen i find that journalists much more than in, in india than in pakistan because of the structure of news reports tend to be given less freedom with reporting indo pak and foreign policy issues because there are assumptions which are sacredly held by the top of desks yes governments may have them too but very often that that prejudice permeates to the top of desks but doesn't go down to journalists who have their freedom and they're not simply allowed to print these things i think we need a major change i agree with you as with the universities no possible development in indo pakistan relations of a consequence can occur without the freedom of information across borders you know what wh- it th- this is so important when the government first moved in a heavy handed way against the net i said get the supreme court decision from delhi on the internet and what strictures were placed is one of the most enlightening pieces luckily the net had it that voice is not given to the times of india and not to dawn or to any of the newspapers we need to fight for that right because television is more capable of compromising on essential conditions with governments newspapers should not be and are generally not uh, the last two questions please yes. people at large in india talk about two dons in karachi the other one of course being your newspaper uh, having said that uh, other one was other one being your newspaper <laughs> uh, uh, having said that sir you know the area of contention is not only restricted to the k word anymore it's also about the d word so what i want to ask is what is the role that is the that the media uh, pakistani media is playing in uh, as an advocacy group or uh, as media pressure group about daud ibrahim being in karachi that's the notion here because every time there's a bilateral talk it's not only about kashmir anymore it's also about daud ibrahim so what's the role that the media is playing uh, to put pressure on uh, the government or uh, the other uh, so called non state uh, players 
uh, in exchanging or you know in bringing back Dao to India? I think it's important to understand that there is no single word to represent media interests in Pakistan. There's huge gaps between the electronic media and the print media. There's huge gaps in the print media between the broadsheets and the tabloids. And these cleavages are there in India as well. But as a rule, media does not get lumped together in Pakistan because many differing interests are fighting in media. It is true to say that some of our high points in media have not been corporatized as effectively or silenced corporately as effectively as in India. At the same time, many of our areas of print media have not developed sufficiently as in India. So I think that that cooperation within media in Pakistan is difficult. And I think that what is surprising is when journalists want to get something done, I remember a meeting in Manila in 1989 or 1991 when uh, I think Arun Puri was there from, the, uh, from India Today and Dilip Padgankar was there from The Times and Dawn was there and several papers were there and they just decided that this time round they are not going to allow the promotion of conflict for the next six months between India and Pakistan. And they did exactly that, and there was no conflict in that period, though much severe provocation was proffered by both governments. I think there's much that media can do, but it's not just India and Pakistan in, uh, which need to have their medias talk to each other. In fact, several people in media talk to each other on a daily basis. We print pieces from the Times of India with their permission. The Hindu pieces, uh, prints pieces from Dawn. That's one form of collaboration. Certainly, we need to enhance it, but it is also true to say that Indian news desks have lost interest in Pakistan in the last 10 years, and the Pakistan embassy has not quite helped heighten that interest. There was a time when Shekhar Gupta, when Barkhadat, when MJ Akbar, when uh, uh, Enram, and all, Sarkar, all these people were fighting and clamoring, and the Pakistan government had to bend to let them in. Today, nobody is fighting from the Indian news desks. It's part of the new materialism. It's part of the new structure of Indian society. Many in Pakistan are also that way, but I appeal to all of you, retain your interest in us, because we will not lose our interest in you. Uh, sir, my question is Sudhinder Sarana. Yeah. My question is two questions, but I will ask you two questions. The first question is that you are thinking about Marathi and Chitrapad Mohotsav in Karachi. You are thinking about it. But it's not a Maharashtra One News Channel. हाँ तुम जो सर्टी आए हैं सुदिन्द्र सर सर सांगा ना प्लीज हेलो हाय आई एम द टाइम्स ऑफ इंडिया uh, Mr. Harun, I have two questions for you, in fact. One is that I was a fan of Mr. Adesh Kraushji's columns in Dawn, and uh, I was always amazed at the way he expressed himself and the freedom he seemed to have. And I was wondering if he was an outlier, or there are many journalists like that who can express themselves that freely and get away with it. And uh, yeah, the second thing I wanted to ask is when uh, Pakistani artists are prevented from performing in India, or Mr. Kulkarni's face is blackened. How does a common man in Pakistan see these acts? Do they think that it represents all of India, or do they understand that they're vested interests and it's just a few groups? Sir, I'm thankful to Dawn. They published the news uh, on 17th December by I.R. Rahman Saab. You mentioned the name Hamid Ansari. I am his mother, Fauzi Ansari. Sir, my son Hamid, he has the same feeling whatever we are having over here, the flag shows, the banner shows. His bag was full of all these things. That he wanted to spread love, peace, harmony. Being a Rotary president, he was, his work was this only. That I never knew that he was friendly with a Pakistani girl. And one day, then he just went missing. And I came to know that it was the reason was that he was very close to a cohort girl, a Pakistani girl. She was a victim of a, some Vani tradition. And he went to rescue her. He, the urgency to go with
without paper was that because his parents and the journalists were forcing the girl to get marriage. So my son went for good intention just to spread love and peace, and he vanished in thin air. So right from the day one, I'm writing to the media, media of Pakistan, media of India. I just sit on net and write emails, letters, try to talk, but my voice is unheard. Though I, with very difficulty, I got a journalist of Pakistan. She tried to help me. I gave her power of attorney. <laughs> she put my matter in court and an inquiry commission. She started her work, but then she also got kidnapped. So my just an appeal, a question is that, can media help me to get my son back? Sir, his intention was good only just to spread peace and love. Whatever we are talking of this year, that the both countries should be together. His intention was also that only. But consequently, what we got, pain, only pain, only pain, and a long way, sir. So please, I request you to do something through your media, sir. Thanks, sir. I thank you for making this comment. I want to tell you that there are things which could possibly be done and some things which may not yield much benefit. Um, the first thing is that you need to have a copy of the papers available with my niece, Yusra Askari, who's sitting up here. She's a, she's a social activist in Karachi and she's also a coordinator for NDTV in, in Pakistan. So she will be able to bring them to me. I will speak to Ayur Rahman, who's one of our most respected journalists, and Zora Yusuf and other members of the HRCP, the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. I will see what can be done to help. I will caution you that the tribal areas like Kohat, which lie very close to the areas of conflict, uh, the kinds of behavior patterns they exhibit with respect to uh, affinities that their daughters might develop with people is usually uh, quite difficult to deal with. but. Certainly, I promise, if you give your phone numbers and your materials to my niece Yusra, I promise to get back to you next week from Pakistan after speaking to Rahman Saab. And I think that if you have anyone temporarily to get in touch with, in case there are any urgent developments, I think Sudhinder would be happy to pay, play that role. I understand the position you are in. No mother should lose her son. And I think, hopefully, he will be restored to you. I think that there's a message of hope somewhere in all of that. If Gita could come back after so many years, even if she has not discovered her real family, maybe her mind is at peace. Sorry, going back to your questions, you spoke about two things. The first was Adesha Kaosji. Adesha Kaosji was not a journalist. Adesha Kaosji was a columnist. He was from an exceedingly wealthy family and he didn't care. He was protected, he didn't make his bread and butter from journalism, and he wasn't gonna compromise, he was that kind of man. In fact, I'm going uh, three days from, um, after my return from Bombay to see a massive wing of a hospital uh, and, a, and a radiology area uh, which has been opened under his name in one of the poorest communities of Karachi. So he was a close family friend and his family was among the fam founding families of Don Karachi. Uh, he enjoyed great prestige. In the beginning, with professional editors, he had all the difficulties that non-journalists have, and gradually he made his own place. He never compromised, but I cannot say, to be honest, that he represented a tradition of journalism. I would say more, li more honestly, he initiated a tradition of journalism. And your second question was? Again, it's, it's a very, uh, Mr. Mahesh Bhatt is sitting up here and he knows that uh, the release of Hum TV's film in Pakistan, um, uh, from Pakistan to Bombay was a ba black mark because Mahesh Bhatt himself, I don't know how far this is known in India, I know exactly how Indo-Pakistani, uh, 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 the theater for Indian cinema opened for exhibition in Pakistan. It was Mahesh and only Mahesh who made all the moves I spoke to Mahesh at that time. I said, it's, there's a faction of people who are trying to use this incident with the Maharashtra state to try and revoke those privileges. To be honest, as he will confirm, uh, uh, both a 
Hindu and Muslim producer of that film, which was stopped, both said they do not wish to see trade between India and Pakistan stopped, and they appeal to Mahesh Bhatt for help to prevent anything happening negatively. Mahesh is going to Pakistan soon, and he will take up that matter with the Pakistani government. But we have to open our forums to each other and not make exclusionary decisions. There are millions of dollars of money from exhibitions in Pakistan uh, for Indian films, which could be choked by uh, people who are over-enthusiastic because this policy is not symmetrical and reciprocal. I want the policy to be symmetrical and reciprocal, but I'm not prepared to reverse the gains already made. And as far as I'm concerned, Indian films should continue to exhibit in Pakistan. It's part of freedom of expression, which we should all respect. And your second question was? That was it. Thanks. No, I, I think it's very important that we understand that as we talk, uh, Fawad Khan was given the best debut award by a group, the Times group. And they only do it when they see that there is a popular support to a particular actor. The Zindagi channel is a phenomenal success. As we talk, Rahat Fateli Khan Sahib is back in India. He may not be in Mumbai, but he's traveling all over and he's embraced by the people and I spoke to him. He said he has, he's overwhelmed that there was no feeling of kind of, uh, any, any kind of uh, bitterness at all. Yeah. Uh, Atif Aslam Sahib travels all over. 31st is going to be the night of entertainment. All these Pakistani actors, uh, uh, singers, will be on some stage or the other uh, entertaining the people of our country. So the fact is, yes, you do have problems uh, time and again, but I think we need to take it in a stride and engage with people who try to disrupt uh, this process. And I think finally, uh, as Hamid said, and as um, Kulkarni Sahib has said, that we will appeal to uh, these people who see them as uh, harmful for our society. That, that is not so. And I, I'm certain that uh, we can appeal to the, 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 the embedded humanity that is there even in them, and they will see the light of uh, uh, sanity, and they will allow that, that they will come when you will not have problems with, with the performing arts. I'm certain about that. I want to add one thing here, that just a week ago, Madhur Bhandarkar, he went to Lahore, he was honored at uh, Lahore uh, Film Festival. So the question is, if Madhur Bhandarkar can, from Mumbai can go to Lahore, Pakistani Kalavantana, Ithe Bandika, a prashna, hyacha uttar, he kunacha, दारावर हे प्रश्न ठेवलेला है त्यांनी याचं उत्तर द्यायला पाहिजे मुंबई शुड वेलकम एव्हरी पाकिस्तानी आर्टिस्ट स्पोर्ट्स पर्सन इंटेलेक्चुअल और पब्लिक फिगर हु हैज गुडविल फॉर इंडिया एंड हु इज कमिंग विथ अ मेसेज ऑफ पीस यू नो वी शुड रिस्टोर the large heartedness of Mumbai. You know, Mumbai is a place, and more than any other city perhaps in India, it is Mumbai that can contribute to bringing our two countries closer. This is, this is a city of Mahatma Gandhi. He, oh, even though he was born elsewhere, the longest period of his political life, public life, was spent in Mumbai. This is the city of Jinnah. He was born elsewhere, but this was his city. And in fact, he wanted to come back to Bombay even after partition. So he did not envision the creation of Pakistan to be uh, something that creates a Berlin Wall between India and Pakistan. So therefore, friends, we, we have to, as he said, take matters in our own hands the people of Mumbai and I appeal 
I appeal today from this forum and from any other forum, I appeal even to Shri Uddhav Thakre, please visit Pakistan. Your understanding of Pakistan will change. The majority of people of Pakistan are full of goodwill towards India. A majority of people of India have goodwill towards Pakistan. There are people of ill will here, there are people of ill will there. But they cannot influence the course of history, and they should not influence the course of history <laughs> by taking things in our own hands. We will be able to influence people in power. Let's make this transition from bad governance to good governance, of course, in many other areas, but especially in the, in the, in the case of India-Pakistan relations. Let's create new history. It is possible. And today's talk was just one small, <laughs> tiny contribution to this effort. We need thousands of such contributions. And there are so many people of goodwill here, creative people who have been in this uh, effort for a long time. Thank you very much. And keep coming to our, uh, our events. And moreover, please participate actively in the activities of uh, the Mumbai Karachi Friendship Forum and also the Sindh Research Project. As uh, Hamid Harun Saab said, you know, it's, it's a very difficult, you know, it's not some superficial interaction. It requires interaction of the best minds, the best scholars of India and Pakistan doing work collaboratively for years together to produce the kind of you know, 20 volumes or maybe more. Hmm? That is the kind of solid contribution that people need to make. And there are people here in Mumbai, there are people in, in Karachi. Our forum and our foundation, similar foundation, similar organization in, 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 in Karachi and Pakistan will come together. Thank you very much. And thanks especially to media, media friends. Of course, there is another, another opportunity that you will have tomorrow when the Press Club of Mumbai and ORF have uh, together organized a media interaction with Mr. Hamid Haroon. Thank you very much. Shukriya. Dhanyawad.